We did a pretty good mixture of nature journaling techniques using ink and watercolor there. That was really fun. And I think I learned a lot and I also pushed my boundary with some of this. And just to finish off here, I'm gonna give you a couple more nature journaling movement tips because people like that so much. But before we learn what stretches to use when you get stiff, and before we have a cool bird experience, and before you learn what's wrong with this pen, let's start with some basic ink and watercolor. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this really nice juicy pen, ink pen, and I'm gonna do my metadata and just kind of get my page broken in. Look how fun it is to use that ink and the metadata gives you a good excuse to get the page started. You can even do a little drawing as part of your metadata. So you can see right there with the metadata, I gotta have a little fun. It's it's very low stakes. I'm not starting with like, you know, a perfectionist drawing of a bird that I saw for three microseconds. I'm starting with something really easy, uh, including a little bit of, of drawing into it, having fun with this tool that is very fun to use and just getting past that first psychological obstacle. Yes, I would look cuter without this hat, or these sun gloves, but being protected from the sun during your nature journaling really helps a lot. I probably should have mentioned there's one really bad thing about this. No. I guess that could be considered a good thing, but since we're gonna do watercolor on top and we want pure colors, we don't want the black from our drawings leaking into the watercolor. But what we can do is at least do some thumbnails. Wait, that big one is not a thumbnail, but these are. With just black, you can do some thumbnail studies and get an idea for the values at least and the composition. So let's figure out what landscape we want to paint. Well, now that I made that big frame, I have to do something in there. So I'm going to do another study, a bigger size, closer to what I want my final painting to look like. And just fun drawing with this ink. I wish it weren't water soluble. Ow, 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 ow. Nature journaling can be hard on your body, so if you notice yourself like cramping up or something, you can take off your pack. The type of pack that I recommend goes over one shoulder, so it is asymmetrical on your body, but any kind of pack on your shoulders while you're drawing, these things can make you tense. So right now I'm gonna show you my patented nature journaling body movement exercise warm-ups in case you're getting stiff. So the first thing I'm gonna do is actually take off my binoculars, my glasses, my layer. Sometimes these things, they're encumbering us and those could be what's making you stiff. Now I'm just gonna loosen up my shoulders a little bit. A lot of people hold tension in the shoulders. Forearms and wrists are one of the main things we use. So I'm doing a couple of these little wrist mobility exercises, stretching those fingers back and then I'm gonna stretch them the other way to get the muscles on the top of my forearms. And then I'm gonna stretch out, this gets my hamstrings, but also it's really helpful for the lower back. Sometimes if your hamstrings are tight, rocking back and forth like this, holding your head down can also sometimes get the hamstrings stretched out a little bit more. And the hamstrings have a big effect on your lower back. I'm just doing some twisting, light twisting just to loosen up and get blood flowing. Sometimes just shaking it out a little bit can be really helpful. And then this is a technique I learned from a rolfing instructor. It's supposed to be for your neck. Um, I, I had this help me when I was birding a lot and birding can be really hard on your neck. Just a couple last few wrist and hand exercises. I'm ready to go now. I'm almost finished with the ink drawing part. So I got my two little thumbnails and I'm just gonna do this last study 
push these values in, these darks. And one thing that you might notice is certain drawing tools cause you to stiffen up more. So for example, for me, fountain pins are a little bit harder on my wrist than other types like brush pins. So you might want to figure that stuff out. But I'm just getting this ink in here. It's really fun to draw with this tool. So a great way to start off my session. Now, all I want to do is get some of these amazing colors down on my paper. Unfortunately, that's not going to be possible on top of these fun, lush, black ink drawings because I currently have water-soluble ink in here. But we can fix that. So I used to wonder if refilling these Fude de Monin pens, if these pens made sense in the field for nature journaling because, you know, they're fountain pens. You have to refill them and stuff like that. And after a year of traveling with them in remote places, including the Galapagos, the Amazon rainforest, cloud forests, all kinds of places, uh, and deserts, I decided it actually can be, you can travel with a whole big thing of ink like this, even on the plane, it is possible. The adapter that works for this fountain pen to be able to hold waterproof ink or any ink of your choosing it has a very small capacity and this this uh this pen one of the best things about it is it can put out a lot of ink so that is the main downside is you can't hold very much ink and you'll run out quickly this is the cartridge that comes with the pen it has water soluble ink this is the little adapter you buy separate and you just twist it like this and you can suck up any ink of your choosing. It should be compatible with fountain pens though. I don't know, I don't really know why they don't just make a cartridge for these that is waterproof. Um, but oh well, we have our own waterproof ink in here now, so it's the fun part. Here you can see once again the landscape that we're working with. There's a lot of layers here. There's a lot of beneficial things for a good landscape painting. You should see my full class on landscape painting to get a better idea of how to choose a good subject. All right, hopefully that's waterproof. I'm gonna go for a slightly faster approach this time, especially because I'm increasing my size. I wanna be careful not to lose track of what I think matters in this. So prioritizing as usual is very important. Let's get where these come out here. I can get these trees where they that definitely goes outside of there. I'm gonna have to put down some pretty big amounts of ink, or I could now use watercolor for some of the work for some of the heavy lifting. Watercolor is fast, um, even compared to an ink um, pen that can really get a lot of line variation and some bit put down a lot of black fast, which is one of the main things that I like about this pen. Um, even so, watercolor, as long as you're not using a nano brush, watercolor is way faster than this. I mean, you could put down ink with a, a brush too if you wanted to. I still kind of want to go for some of that stark um, look in here, so. Definitely lots of darks to push in this composition. Now important for me over here is this dead tree most important. Well, maybe most important is that other weird thing. I guess I'll do the live tree in front. 
even though it's not in my original. I gotta make sure I leave space for this amazing dry grass that's in a lot of this area. Ellipses. If you don't know what an ellipse is and why it's super important right here, then you should go do my Skillshare class on landscape painting. And hopefully I'll, um, in this next year or so, have start to have all of my classes on my website. So I need to channel or call on two of my all-time favorite artists battling it out for number one. I'm not sure I go back and forth on which one is my number one favorite artist of all time, but usually battling it out right there at the top are Yvonne Bilibin, the early 20th century, turn of the century illustrator from Russia. And, um, um, Bill Watterson, the uh, artist and writer behind the um, the super well-known and just incredi incredibly beautiful Calvin and Hobbes comic. If you ever look at the some of those Sunday editions. Um, or if you look at the ink work on some of those trees on snowy, snowy northeastern North America winters, the way he does the snow and the trees, um, it's amazing. His depictions of Martian landscapes or deserts, dinosaurs, aliens. The guy's amazing. Even if you didn't read the comics at all or follow the story at all, the artwork is up, really up there in my opinion. Okay, so I might lose a little bit of this effect that these trees had um, connecting together. Um, Bill Watterson, help me out. Yvonne Billy Bean, you can do this. Either of those artists would have a field day on this landscape. Okay, that might be, I might be run. am I running out of the ink in this thing already? I told you it doesn't hold very much. Okay, push the values in here just a little bit, a few more places. All right, now we just need to wait for that to dry. Actually, we don't need to wait for this to dry. Let's do some botanical sketches. Look how awesome this bush is. And this is a really cool time of year to look at it. And we're gonna do a quick sketch of this and the ink tool that we're using is perfect for this. All right, let's go for something fast here. I'm gonna sort of look at this area right right here. Something simple, wait, actually, there we go, right there. I got two different colors of berries, or pff, more than two. I've got a spectrum of colors of, of, of berries, and I think the angles on the leaves, the foreshortening is not gonna be too crazy, and I can kind of get 
the overall idea. This is not an il this. I wouldn't consider this an illustration, like a botanical illustration, because it's not going to be that precise. Nevertheless, this would be informed by the practice of botanical illustration and botany in general. So I'm not just going to like make up aspects of this. For example, whether the leaves are opposite or alternate is something I would not make up. The way the, um, the little stem attaches to the berry on these, I would not make that up. The, the leaf margin being slightly dentate, I would not make that up either because those are all things that are helpful for identification of plants. So it's good to know, similarly with mushrooms or birds or whatever, some of the things that are important to have accurate and what are the things that maybe you could um, fudge or use some artistic license on. Might have been even easier if I had just picked a branch and sort of simplified what I'm looking at. It's really hard to not get caught up in the complexity. Okay, I think that's kind of good for that. And now I want to get a close up of a leaf. It's pretty curled up. So one of the things I'm going to do also is I'm going to use notes here and I'm going to create a um, zone for notes here. Leaf is not very flat. It doesn't want to lay, lay flat. Now, how long did it take me to write that? So writing is a part of nature journaling and that just shows, for example, what I just did there, that words sometimes are worth a thousand pictures. It's the opposite when you have to draw the pictures yourself. So um, if you can write something down with a few words that conveys a lot of information that would take you a long time to draw, that could be um, useful. Also, these kinds of notes can also be a way to kind of mentally jujitsu your uh, procrastination and inner self-critic into actually trying to draw certain things. So like if you notice, uh-oh, I'm realizing this is going to be hard to draw because of the foreshortening on it and you start worrying, then just write something, write an observation and then maybe come back to it and um, approach it in a little bit with a little bit of um, lower stakes. Making small drawings is another way. So like what if I just did a study of this leaf in a variety of positions um, to try to practice it. And I, I make those small. I could also make it into a diagram. Those would all be ways to deal with what I think is coming up in me, which is just a little bit of um, fear around trying to do a big drawing of this leaf because I know that its shape is gonna be challenging to simulate the three-dimensional shape of it the three-dimensional reality of it onto a two-dimensional page with the drawing tools and skills that I have and time. So see, I just did three little sketches there and a little bit of a description. And at least that got me through that stage and I got a little bit of the um, plant itself. Now I'm gonna try to get some berries like really close to the actual size. And I'm also noticing it's pale near um, where the berry attaches. So I wonder if it's pale on the inside. Question asking is a really important part of nature journaling. It's great for your brain in general. You probably hear this crunching grass under my feet. And that's some, one of the colors we're really gonna wanna capture. So I feel like there's some things that I, I could benefit from compositionally here, but I think that this um, is probably dry enough to try to do some color. Maybe we could do a few more things down here and then we can do our color all at once. We've been putting off the color part for too long, so let's dive into watercolor in our nature journal and see how it works with this ink. Fingers crossed that this actually is waterproof ink. All right. We're gonna start with the palest colors first, and that's often the sky with very few exceptions. So let's think about the sky. There is a lot of 
cloud cover. But I'm gonna get this manganese blue here. And now for the moment of truth. Look at that. Holy cow. It's waterproof. Get these sky holes in. Those are sky holes I could show to Yvonne Billy Bean. Blue barely shows up on camera, but it is supposed to be really, really pale. Blue is a tricky color. It doesn't want to be pale. It's very strong. It's a very strong pigment, but the sky is very pale. So people end up accidentally making their sky too dark because they were trying to get the hue of the blue. That's a really staining one. Look at that. Oh wait, maybe not. God. Okay, now next is the, the ground. The flat surface is usually the next palest. And here, that is the case. Uh, I need to refill my buff titanium because that would be a really good color for this grass. The look of this grass can be very characteristic in California. So it's a good color to practice if you work in California a lot. As you can tell from my accent, I do work in California a lot. Look at that. And this color can be so beautiful and it's usually invasive grasses that aren't really as adapted and have as many um, benefits in the California ecosystem as the native grasses, but they sure do um, look really pretty when they're at this stage and they're all dried up from a distance. Yeah, maybe do a little wet on wet there. But that's the basic grass in there. Color really captures a lot. And this, this scene, you know, it's fun to work with water-soluble ink and just do a, a black and white drawing of a scene like this. But geez, getting this, this color is such an important um, such an important part of the scene. And I forgot this was also some grass here. I need to put my sunglasses on because my eyes are getting a lot of white bouncing off the paper. While we're waiting for that to dry, let's just go in here on this bush and um, do, do some of the colors for this bush right here while we're waiting. We might as well, right? So there's some really cool colors in here. And I'm going to start again with the palest one. So it looks like some of these berries are um, yellow. Maybe even a little bit of green. But mostly yellow. And yellow is the opposite of blue. It's very um, weak. And it's very hard to get a dark value of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with that. It's also really easily polluted by the other colors. I'm gonna use my main primary yellow here to start. And I'm gonna go underneath a lot of these cause it looks like, um, oops, that one probably should have been one of the dark ones. And the dark ones are often really close to the, the unripe ones. I'm assuming the dark ones are the ripe ones. Okay, and then while these are still a little bit wet, I'm gonna put in, some of them are like rosy red, um, maybe quinacridone with pyrrole red. Toned down a little bit and actually not toned down too much. And then while these are still wet, hopefully I can just get a little wet on wet on some of these. And this is 150 GSM paper with, I think, a medium grain surface. And you can see that it's still possible to get 
wet on wet effects on this paper. It's not as amazing as it would be on some arches, but I think that's a really good balance for, you know, like doing this kind of drawing with an ink pen on arches or a more textured watercolor paper would not be would not be very fun. So I think this is actually a really good type of paper for a middle of the road nature journaling um, sketchbook. Okay, so now I'm going to actually come in and do some of the green color and maybe even put yellow underneath all of this. And it looks to me like these stems, the, the stems leading to the berries also have a lot of yellow. Oh, wow. Flock of other starlings? I think they're starlings, so not the coolest I mean, they're not a, they're an invasive species here, but wow, when they fly all together in a group, it's pretty cool. Oh, they even make a sound. All right, so how am I gonna nature journal that? Okay, see, this is why it's good to come out here and nature journal plants and landscapes because you get to have cool other experiences that happen on the side. Bobcat could walk by, you could see a murmuration of starlings. Yes, they are trash birds, but that's what nature journaling is for. Major journaling can turn trash birds into fascinating trophies. But I don't want to put starlings on my page. I got this pretty page. It's all plants. I don't know how I'm going to draw them. They're, they look like they'll be really hard. I could mess everything up. Come on, come on. That was a cool experience to see them. So at the very least, I'm going to put some notes here. And one thing I could do, and this pin is perfect, is I could make sort of these little micro starlings and try to show the murmuration and maybe even make some type of comic or use a comic technique to um, show what's going on here. So for example, an arrow. And then what did they sound like? Whoosh. Whoosh. And then I'll guess how many there were. Shoot. I wasn't really paying attention to that. Um, I could give a range approximately, I would say 50 starlings. All right, so I at least got that, right? Back to plants and watercolor and landscapes. All right, so the next big important color for me is gonna be Serpentine Genuine. And this is Dan these are mostly Daniel Smith colors. This is the John Muir Law's custom watercolor palette. It's, it's amazing. It's the main watercolor palette I've used for the past 10 years. Okay, so now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put a lot, use a lot of this. And this also is a color that's not very, not a very dark value. But there's one other thing I forgot in the foreground. I wanted to make the colors different on. And then I'm gonna put a few in here that I didn't draw in. This is part, this field and how you draw or paint these bushes is gonna have a really big impact on whether this looks like a three dimensional landscape or whether it looks like a flat, mosaic of shapes and the effect of of creating something that looks like a 3d landscape that you can step into if you can achieve the illusion of three-dimensionality that has a really big impact on the way it looks overall and the feeling you get from it the feeling of being able to walk into that if you if you wanted to 
Okay, so I'm gonna take that same Serpentine Genuine um, and I'm going to paint the um, plant over here. It looks like there's some red on the stems and the veins of the leaves look mostly yellow, so I don't have to worry about red um, in the leaves. This could be an interesting study. You could spend all day trying to match these berries because they have variation between the ripe ones. Like, look at that, that's beautiful. Wow. Wow, wow. I should take some macro photos of that. That looks like something from outer space. That is so beautiful. Okay, the more emotionally you are attached to something, the harder it is to draw or paint it. So don't fall in love with things too much before you try to draw them. This might be one of the reasons why you're more afraid to draw your um, family members or your pets um, or your favorite orchid or certain groups of animals that you really, really admire or love. Those can often be harder to paint because you're, you're often more attached to the outcome because you're more attached to the subject. All right, now I'm gonna try to get the color of the eucalyptus trees in this foreground color. Uh, maybe some gray colors or uh, these trunks aren't really white. So I'll put a little bit of this pink color on them. And I've got another dead tree here in the foreground that needs some color. That tree didn't get that much love um, for a dead tree. Dead trees are usually a really low hanging fruit there for fun drawing. Now, let me just get that, um, that color of those trees. And I think there's a way to mix my red. If I mix this quinacridone sienna with the right green, it can come out right. There's a way to make this kind of glow. I'm gonna start with just straight quinacridone sienna and see what happens. So this is quinacridone sienna over here. It's a, it's a really cool color. I mean, it's a really amazing, wonderful color. It's not cool, it's warm. And let's come in here and do this foreground plant. I feel like has a glow about it. Maybe quinacridone gold would even work for this. Um, and the edge, eucalyptus can get this edge to them, uh, the new growth and stuff. Let's see if we can lift a little bit of these and then put in, oh yeah, and I'm going to make it come down into the other stuff, but now let's see if we can put, uh, um, I got that. Now let's see if we can put a little bit of quinacridone gold, um, into it. Well, it's still wet. Quinacridone gold is one of my colors that I like the most and use the most. It's, it's amazing. It's really cool. No, just kidding. It's not cool. Once again. All right, that's perfect. Now I'm going to come in and let's see if I can just take um, serpentine genuine and put that into these while they're still like this actually it almost looks like a what kind of green is that I'm gonna need to get the value a lot darker because these are backlit trees um, they're backlit trees and the ones next to them are black <laughs> so if I didn't give any color on the, the conifers, um, they're all black, I probably should push the values on this. So what I'm going to do is while this is still wet, I'm just doing this completely a la prima for this part. I'm going to just put drop in some of this, um, my darkest value green. And this is going to be messy. This is going to take 
10 minutes to dry no good job marley all right while i've got this out i'm gonna do my other dark um things that i want to have like a lot darker green on them but not too close to that black because then there's not like a value hierarchy in it it's pointless to have black if you have something really close to black So I don't know if I got the values right. Um, I think there's a weird gap in the values, but hey, it's something. Now I'm gonna do that really dark berry. I almost don't even know where to start with that, to tell you the truth. But I'll start with Windsor Violet and some Naphthamide Maroon. Naphthamide Maroon is a great color. Definitely not dark enough. I probably should have used my other brush. But since I've got it on my brush, I'm going to put it on all the berries. So far, it's not the right color. And this is something that if I'm nature journaling, I would not want to be this far off on a color. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm just making art in nature, that's fine. But like, if I actually want to convey information about this plant, um, I wouldn't leave it at that. Or if I did, if that's the only color I could get it to be, um, I would write next to it. Actually, it's darker than this. It's blah, blah, blah. You can use words to describe colors, but if you're trying to show a specific plant, um, then that's the kind of thing that can be really important is like, what are the actual colors here? Like, I'm not just going to make them up or if I make them up, I'm going to write that down. Um, and I'm going to think about why I would want to make them up versus trying to match what I see in real life. So I'm going to let that dry and then I'm going to put another layer on to make those really dark. Okay, the more I look at the colors on some of these berries, the more I realize I need to try to, I need to try to recreate these colors um, and work on these colors a little bit more on my page. So I'm gonna use my water brush that puts out a little bit less water. And I'm gonna come and first, I'm gonna work on the ones that I started already and see if I could put in, I need, that Windsor Violet wasn't really the right color to start with. I need something warmer. And I think what I'm going to try is Naphthamide Marine. So I'm going to get some of my Naphthamide Maroon. It's not, still not warm enough, so I'm gonna add Pyrol Red to that. Get a little more of that Windsor Violet in there and see what this looks like on some of these. Okay, now I need to push these values on these ones at the very least, so don't have a ton of options. What I can try is I could try doing straight Windsor Violet. That does get pretty dark. I could also use something like neutral tint. Let's start with this and see how, what kind of progress we make. It's actually pretty good. See, taking something that you see in nature as, and you might normally just pass off as black, same with colors like white. You take something like this and you apply a nature journaling practice to it, 
and you start actually looking at these colors a little bit and trying to match them and you'll realize things are often um, way more interesting color wise than you initially thought even though some of these are pretty close to black <laughs> it depends on the light too but now i'm seeing these are still way too purple so i'm going to wait for it to dry and do um, one more color on it i can also make notes about this whole process like what colors i used let's get a little naphthamide maroon on there because i love naphthamide maroon so much and then once that's dry once that's dry we're going to come back with the big guns in terms of getting it closer to black <laughs> what is black what is the color black you know let's write that down This is why it's good to be able to use, have one handable tools, or at least practice one hand ability. So I'm gonna write, what is black? And what a great question for a session where we're working with ink. What is black? Okay, so now let's just go straight to neutral tint. Because this is something where you want to be careful. You could lose the accuracy of the hue as you try to get the accuracy of the value. All right, I think that's pretty close. We tried a bunch of different nature journaling techniques using ink and watercolor water soluble ink we could play around with that more see how you got the shadows there and also with the color and trying to match the color on these berries asking a bunch of questions seeing a murmuration of birds so great nature journaling session overall check out my other videos for tips and join my patreon to help support the show see you next week bye